Nymphia, how are you? Robert, I'm good. How are you? Doing great. Wanted to see if we could go on a musical journey together before a uh, dream dance and all that came about and your musical career started. What were the bands that you first heard or artists that you first heard that really moved you? Well, obviously, my top influence was Kate Bush, for sure, without question. As far as any other artists, um, uh, Peter Gabriel's one as well, is that correct? Yeah, I would say uh, I lived on the East Coast and I thought I want to kind of soak in all of that San Francisco sound. And so I moved out here. So that was a huge influence on me was Jefferson Airplane. And then uh, Chrissy Hind of The Pretenders, Janis Joplin and Maria Callas in the opera world because of her intense artistry and expression. Led Zeppelin for their, their songwriting, Jimmy Page's guitar playing, uh, you know, Robert Plant's vocals, Heart, I would also put in there, Ann Wilson, Tina Turner. And then late, you know, later, once I discovered Kate Bush, Peter, you know, and I also listened to Genesis in high school. So, you know, the early Genesis, uh, and then Peter Gabriel, of course, and then later artists like Bjork and Dead Can Dance and Sneaker Pimps and Cocteau Twins. Uh, bat for lashes in the you know some of the later 90s artists that came out you remind me of the time when especially on the first album dream dance when peter gabriel released security and he actually owned his skills for the sense of rhythm one of the things i learned about my process as a songwriter doing this that very first album was that I tend to be inspired first by rhythm. And what I would do is I would just find some sort of rhythmic loop in my library of something that all of a sudden triggered an inspiration. And then from there, the song would start unfolding. And so when you said that, it was very interesting to me because maybe that somehow seeps through the music and you know rhythm is actually the first foundational principle of music and Absolutely. i remember one thing i learned in music school was you know if the the odd that's the first thing that the audience will detect if there is like a mistake is a rhythmic like oh. because music there's, there's actually this other thing that I think is really interesting is music is based on two principles, all music, the rhythm of your heartbeat or your breath. And it goes to that much of a primal basis. And so I think that's why when, if there's some glitch in the rhythm, it's like, it's, you know, a glitch in your breathing and in your heart, which is the source of your life, you know, it becomes that primal. Yeah, um, I don't know if you know the story behind Security by Peter Gabriel, but he actually visited Africa and uh, learned um, many different uh, tribal beats. Mm -hmm. And he was looking to improve his skill in the rhythm department because his melodies have always been amazing throughout his whole career. Mm -hmm. and yeah. He felt that was the one area that he needed to really hone his skills on. And uh, it truly showed on security. I thought that was a landmark album for him. You know, you're inspiring me to go back and listen to that then with that in mind. I, I remember uh, in the 90s when world music really started to take off and there were a lot of artists. I mean, remember uh, Paul Simon too, took sure. a lot of inspiration out of the African rhythms. And I know that um, Stuart Copeland of the police studied polyrhythms and course ginger baker moved to africa there was there was a big renaissance of pop big name mainstream artists going there to source and start weaving that through their music and honestly world music is something that very much inspires my music it's it's all over the new album and it was in the my first album too so i i remember when i went to music school i considered 
majoring in world music. And at that time, it wasn't really a thing yet. So it was extremely difficult to find resources. You know, you'd go to the library and there was like three vinyl records. One was like a Tibetan monk chanting and maybe there was something of a gamelan orchestra from Bali, but there was nothing like what there, the explosion that there is now. So I eventually abandoned that idea because I was like, how am I even gonna resource these things? But I do weave it into my music now. And you I do. I love it. Yeah. I mean, one of my new songs on my new album, which is the song is called The Train. And it's a song about the linearity of time. Because whenever I have a dream and I'm on a train, it's a dream about being stuck in the inevitable that I can't, I'm not choosing the path versus, for instance, in a dream if I'm driving my own car. So the song, The Train, is about being captured in this prison of our 3D world and linear time. Um, but I wanted to write the song. It's kind of a little bit of a hybrid of the Robert Plant, Alison Krauss album and mm -hmm. some of the Peter Gabriel stuff. And I, I really wanted to have like a Celtic influence so I hired two Celtic musicians on it, and I'm so excited about it. Uh, one of them is Declan Masterson, who uh, was the music director for Riverdance, and he's an extraordinary uh, whistle player. So he plays those beautiful high-flying Celtic flute lines. And then uh, the other one is Morris Dickerson, who is a Celtic banjo player. Uh, and so I hired them, and it just, brings the track alive. So there's all this Celtic influence in that song uh, as an example of some world music that's being on the next album. And I also have some Greek aulos on one of my songs on the next album. The song is called Pythia. Uh, on Dream Dance, I had you know, the, the Bodrin drums and that first song, Dream Dance, kind of weaves in a lot of world music elements in it. So yeah, I'm a big fan of it, I guess. I could go on forever, but I won't. <laughs> I want to also ask you, uh, in the making of Dream Dance, um, at what moment, because I know you have an extensive music background, at what moment did you decide that this was the time for you to release something of your own? That's such a great, great question. I have always wanted to be doing what I'm doing right now ever since I was four or five years old and I ended up uh, taking this very roundabout way <laughs> to get here when I started taking voice lessons to I was playing in bands in in college and kind of straining my voice so I thought oh I, I think I better take some voice lessons and, and then that sent me on this long amazing multicolored all over the country journey of singing opera and learning that it, it, extraordinary music by these great masters and the discipline, the incredible athletic discipline it takes to be an opera singer and to stand on those big stages and you know your vocal cords are these tiny little things and so to be able to project over orchestras of 60 pieces etc etc it's so I did that and uh, all the while I was doing that, it was always in the back of my mind. I always straddled the two worlds. You know, I still sang pop music. I still sang with bands and did other gigs. Most of my opera singer colleagues, the vast majority did not do that at all. They stayed right in their lane because it's hard to straddle those worlds vocally. And in 2006, my fiance, at the time, Keith Keller, who was a record producer that I had met doing some gigs in New Orleans, uh, died very unexpectedly. And it sent me into a whole other journey of healing and rediscovery. And when I emerged from that, I just all of a sudden had this realization that now is the time for me to do what I've always wanted to do which is be a recording artist, singer, songwriter. And so that was around 2013 to 2014, I sat down and started in earnest writing. I also, a con contributing factor was this studio because I you know, by then had bought a house 
built this studio so I had the working space finally to do it. And technology had caught up where I could use computers and you can record digitally. You didn't need to, you know, slice a two inch tape for editing, for instance, you right. know, because I had done all the, I'd been a studio session singer for jingles and television shows and movies and things like that. I was in the studio when they were doing that, you know, slicing the two inch tape and going, oh my God, you know, the, the, the infrastructure you needed in the old world of recording was expensive and a rarity. And all of a sudden it became available to all these indie artists and therefore the indie music exploded. So I was part of that explosion. And so I sat down to write in earnest in 2013, 2014. And it took me uh, four years to put Dream Dance together because I did virtually all of it, uh, all the laying in of the parts. I had a couple guest musicians, uh, one of them, Gentry Bronson, a pianist, singer, songwriter, really helped me launch the project because he helped write some of the lyrics and just the infusion of his energy gave me some momentum. He played some of the piano parts on the recording and Ray Schaefer, my bass player and mix master extraordinaire with whom I play in another band, which is an avant-garde band called Tried Corner Tent Show. He also contributed the bass parts. But aside from that, everything else I laid in, the keyboard parts and the loops and editing the drums and playing the guitar and all the vocals. So it just took forever to do all that and writing in the studio in that way. I didn't write conventionally like, oh, I think I'll just play my guitar and write a song. I sat down with some of these loops and just started constructing these songs. It was it was a really extraordinary uh, exercise and a huge, huge undertaking. And that's why it took so long. But it was, a, you know, I feel like it's something that uh, the way I made that album is somewhat uh, unusual and I think that's why the album has an unusual type of quality to it in the end. Well it has a very uh, original feel to it uh, one and uh, two each song uh, takes you on an individual journey it's almost uh, cinematic in feel. Yes I would say you know it's interesting you say that because that that is what I intended when I first sat down to write the album, the very first song I wrote was um, Wasteland. And it started with that great long loop that I discovered. And I kind of laid that in and I started, the, the chorus just literally just came to me. It was one of those magical creator moments that anyone who's a writer or creator knows, like it's almost like you can feel your crown chakra opening up and it goes, whoa, and it just drops in. You're going, whoa, what was that? So it was really extraordinary. I, I started weeping afterwards because I was like, this is this is it. This is what I'm looking for. So uh, at any rate, once I wrote that song, I, I all of a sudden, as the other songs started coming, I started realizing that, oh, this, this whole album is actually telling a story. And it ended up being a hero's journey type of story. And then I realized it was telling the story of what happened with Keith and losing him and the process of redemption and healing that I had to go through to come back to the living. And, you know, it's one of those things where art reveals itself to you, like a sculptor when they're using a big stone or a big tree, they don't know what it's going to be yet until it reveals itself to you. And that's really what the process of dream dance was for me. So. I love to hear what you just said, because I hear that from everybody, that each song, you get immersed in each song, and each song is a story, but everyone has all said, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, that it's something that you want to experience from start to finish. It's almost like a shamanistic journey in a way. I've, t I've had people tell me they use it for journeying and meditation and things like that, which kind of surprised me. That I didn't expect it to be, but, yeah, I, I'm just enamored with this idea that I believe is so true that the art will reveal itself to you if you just open yourself up to it. That's that's the hard part, opening yourself up to it, you know, shutting out the mundane world and getting into that space. It's like a sacred container that you need to let it flow through you. 
Uh, and speaking of the album, I wanted to know if you could speak of the title track, Dream Dance. Yeah, that song was inspired by a book uh, called Color. And I was reading, it was, it's a book, um, Findlay is the last name of the artist. I mean, the writer, I believe. And I'm a painter too. So it was a book about how colors were, uh, are generated throughout the planet. You know, the, the natural resources that are used for color. So she traveled throughout the world and went to these places and researched the process of making pigments for paint. So the first chapter, she went to, um, the aboriginals down in Papua New Guinea for the color of ochre and you know in that chapter talked about their dream time and you know their distinction of dream time which is that life is more of the dream time and the other side is reality is one of their distinctions and I was when I was reading about the dream time which I was aware of before but somehow it's something struck a chord with me reading this book I, I all of a sudden had this awareness of we are all living in our own dream dance of creation, you know, as we're creating our lives, we're creating children. If you're an artist, you're creating works of art, you, whatever your art is, and you're creating businesses, we're creating all the time. And it's this big, like, I just saw this vision of this very complex swirling dance of creation that we are living in, this dream dance. So that's what the song is about, is that we're all here creating. And so, uh, you know, it talks about cave paintings, you know, from the original creations up till now. And the whole point of it is that we want to connect with someone else or with the divine. It's all about connection. So that's what the song is about. And that's, as I put it together, I wanted to weave in all of these aspects from didgeridoo kind of low, um, low frequency rhythm track. And then the, the primal drums and the, the banshee wails, which to me are just these, again, use the word, I hate to overuse it, but these kind of primal wails of humanity woven in with, mm -hmm. I added some of my opera singing to as the, like a more civilized version of that, you know, as we move through time from early to current time. Uh, and so that was the vision for that song. And then when I took a trip to Ireland, because I'm very interested in a lot of the ancient sites and, and castles and these, these massive monuments that humans have built, you know, these huge standing stone circles that we still are, are mysterious to all of us. Um, we decided then, oh, let's shoot some of the video there with intertwined with these stone circles. And I went to Skellig, that incredible island off the southwest coast of Ireland where they shot Star Wars with these bee huts from 500 BC with no mortar. I mean, they're still standing and they just are stacked stones where the monks lived on that island. Just these extraordinary places, all of which to me were representative of our urge to build and create in our massive dream dance of creation that's moving through time. And I know that's kind of a big vision, but <laughs> that's that's how my mind works. I start spiraling out sure. into these big, you know, global kinds of views of things. And it's so hard to encapsulate sometimes in language and in music, but that's the, it's like a puzzle, you know, how to, how to encapsulate, how to get that message across. And I wanted to also ask you, uh, as far as that track is concerned, um, when it came about to you, this uh, idea, did you uh, foresee it as a uh, message to you that this journey of life uh, that we all run through is uh, more or less a series of doors that, that we all uh, make our choices to go through which ones we choose. Oh yeah, you just hit the nail on the head of, I think, everything. I believe every moment is choice. As a matter of fact, speaking of that, that's one of my new songs on my new album, which is called What Have I Forgotten? The song is called Liminal, and <clears throat> that song is very much about these choice points in life that we have. <clears throat> you know, liminal means in between spaces, the transitionary zones. And anyone who's done any sort of meditation or any magical working, trance work, any sort of self 
deep type of work is very familiar with those transitions. Actually, you know what? You don't even have to be one of those people. When you wake up, when you're waking up out of a dream or you're daydreaming in class or at work and you're kind of in that in-between state and you're like, oh, you know, that's a liminal moment. And so those liminal moments of those in-between states are happening all the time. And we are at choice in those moments of how we're going to respond. And that was something that I learned from the loss of Keith. You know, the, the death of someone that you love so profoundly is extremely traumatic. And it's how you choose to come out of that. You know, what, what are you going to, what is the meaning that you're going to extract from that? Uh, you can choose to let it define you. You can choose to overcome it. You can choose to hold it as a sacred shrine forever. You could choose to be at the mercy of it, at the will of it, whatever your choice is. And I'm such a big believer in that every moment we are choosing that. You can choose to be mad at your cat for knocking over your milk or you're like, okay, well, they knocked over the milk. I love you anyway. Give them a kiss. You know, it does. Every moment is that way. Our relationships, our work, our lives. And, you know, from big choices, like should I move to New York to should I be feeling angry right now or just, you know, release that. And so that liminal is about that. And it's also about being in the in-between states and moving between worlds and how much power there is in that. Once you learn to be a fluid, a fluid practitioner of that, you know, I believe that the more we are at choice and able to be at choice in our lives, the more powerful we are to manifest what we want from our lives. I also want to ask you, upon completion of Dream Dance, um, at what point did you decide to record Naked Gates? So after I did Dream Dance and released it, I went through a massive personal transformation because my identity shifted from professional opera singer to Nymphia, singer, songwriting, recording artist. And people started buying the album and writing me emails about how much it meant to them and how much they loved my music. And uh, I started learning and realizing that this transformation is complete, almost complete. Like, I, okay, now I am, this is my primary expression as an artist now. And it really is meaning something to people because when I released it, I had no idea how it was going to be received. And I was very anxious about it. I was having nightmares. I couldn't sleep. Like the first the month before the actual release, I was a complete basket case. Like, what am I doing? I'm like, why should I do this? No, what are you, why are you going to humiliate yourself? You know, all those thoughts that we all have, even though while that voice was running the other quiet wise voice was saying it's okay i know there are people out here that really are going to love this they want to hear this this is good you've done good work you you know you've really devoted a lot of yourself to this so just hang on you know i had those two parts so after i released it it was such a who i was exhausted i was burned out i was just okay, I need to not do anything for a few months. So I would say I probably took like three or four months off from anything. And then the emails started coming and the responses started rolling in. And I started seeing the power that this music had. And that I started getting me the fires burning again, like, hmm, okay, wow, this is, yay. I'm not a sham. I didn't humiliate myself right. after all. Oh, yay. <laughs> so, um, and literally I would write, it was right around uh, Kate Bush released her entire, re-released in her remastered catalog. So it was around December and January of 2019 or 18, 18, I guess. And um, I started buying all of it. I just bought her entire vinyl remastered collection and just listened to all of it again and immersed myself in her world. Even I got her um, signed book, How to Be Invisible, uh, with her signature on the front page as like a talisman for my studio. And I did this little magical little ritual of 
holding my hands over the, her signature and asking for inspiration and energy from you know her vector of genius to help me with my writing and infuse my studio with the music and the creativity. I'd forgotten that I had done that little thing. And then like two or three months later, I woke up from this dream with this vision and this voice that said, why don't you record an album of Kate Bush songs stripped down all acoustically and call it Naked Kate? And I was just like, what a great idea. Okay, I think I will do that. And then I just literally went, went for it. And then I remembered months later, this little magical thing that I'd done. And I thought, oh my God, the magic was so powerful that I actually recorded a whole album of her stuff. <laughs> it was kind of extraordinary, really. So that set me on a path of listening to her catalog all over yet again to curate the material, which was a joy to go through and just rediscover everything yet again with a different ear towards, will this work well with just acoustic guitar and voice? Cause you know, I, not every song does lend itself to that. Sure. And right. uh, yeah, and once I selected the material, then I contacted my wonderful musician friend named Alex McMurray, who's an extraordinarily great musician who lives in New Orleans. I met him when I was in New Orleans a lot with Keith, who, who was my, my fiance who had passed. Alex McMurray is a, people compare him to Randy Newman a little bit or Tom Waits. He's a singer songwriter. He's got this gruff, wonderful voice, great guitar player. And I knew he would just be a, a, a really, really key uh, supporter and colleague for this because I wanted more than just my guitar. So I sent him all of the songs that we were doing and like a champ, he, when he finally showed up from New Orleans, we met a couple times via Zoom to talk through things, but he showed up for a long weekend here. He knew he had learned everything. He had charted it all out. And we sat down, rehearsed here for like a half a day and then went into the studio at Jamie Bridges studio uh, called Room with the View and uh, recorded the entire, all the guitar tracks in like three days, two and a half days. And it was a monumental task to just to get them all down and something that was compelling and correct. It, musically, it was very, uh, what can I, it's not, not challenging really, but just all encompassing to really um, immerse yourself into another artist's songwriting, as Alex called it, getting to, to the DNA of their songs so that you really understand what the song is trying to say at its most core principle level, stripped away of all the production. Because one of the things I actually love about Kate Bush is her high production value and her creative production values. I love those, but this wasn't about that. This was about focusing on her songwriting. And I sometimes feel like because of her extraordinary production, the songwriting can get lost sometimes about just, this is the song and this is how good the song is. So doing that uh, was not only a labor of love, but it ended up being a, a great teacher for me of how she really put her songs together. And I'm convinced from, that to my current album, I can see how it's influenced my songwriting. It's, it's, it's just brought my own songwriting to a whole other level of having to immerse myself that deeply into what she did. And I am that album for me, when I, I just went back and listened to a couple of tracks like two weeks ago. And every time I do, I just go, Oh my God, I can't believe we did this. It's just, it was, it was a, another extraordinary and magical experience. The three of us, Alex, Jamie, and I, it's like we had this love fest weekend of music making that for every one of us is this little jewel in our life experience. Yeah, I love that album. I love that album. I first noticed at, at looking through the tracks, I noticed that Wuthering Heights and this woman's work wasn't on there. I wanted to know, did you feel that, was there a sense of them not being on the album, a part of being that these shouldn't be touched? Wuthering Heights, I felt that way for 
I, I thought, you know, what can I bring to an acoustic version of Wuthering Heights that hasn't already been done a hundred thousand times on YouTube? <laughs> so <Right. laughs> you go to YouTube and just search for Wuthering Heights covers and you will see some really, really good ones to some, oh, good Lord. What? And, and I thought, you know, I don't see a need to, to strip that song down to its essential core. Also, because that song is so iconic, just the way it stands. I just didn't feel that there needed to be another little addendum added to that song. And then this woman's work, I wasn't sure how to bring it alive acoustically with guitar. You know, she did a, a beautiful re uh, mix or re recording of it with just piano and voice. And it was yeah. really, it was so touching and moving. And I, I just wasn't sure. I don't know. It just didn't move me the way, for instance, under the Ivy did like that to me was like, I know I have to do under the Ivy. It's going to be amazing with just voice and guitar. Uh, so yeah, the, the curation process was very, very, very interesting. I also did not include anything off of her uh, 50 Words for Snow album because that also none of them lent themselves to this sort of treatment. Ariel is one of my Abs my three favorite albums of hers are Hounds of Love, The Dreaming, and Ariel. And, you know, this this is an ongoing conversation of every Kate Bush aficionado. What are your favorite albums? And, you know, it's always right. a cause for debate, right? Uh, Ariel, to me, is oh, so stunningly gorgeous. And I had to include something from that album. But again, most of those songs do not lend itself well to an acoustic guitar treatment. But Joni is one of my favorite songs on the album anyway. And the minute I heard it, I thought, this is going to work. And I love what Alex and I did with that song. It's one of my favorite songs on, on the album. Uh, but of course, I wanted to include something from every album if I could. And I did manage to do it, except for 50 Words of Snow. The other difficult one was the dreaming because, oh, that album is so brilliant, but so much about production. So how are we going to take one of those songs and strip it down to acoustic guitar? And I realized Suspended and Gaffa would be a good choice. And I, I love that track, too, on Naked wow. Kate. Hounds of Love, I had to stop myself from picking songs from Hounds of Love. If you notice, there's three of them on there from Hounds of Love because there were so many yes. that could work so well with this treatment. And um, Running Up That Hill, to me, is another one of, one of the great, iconic, brilliant Kate Bush songs. And so deciding how I was going to do that song, I took it really seriously because I felt I really wanted to do something that gave it some difference or some reason to exist. And I realized that there's a there's a plaintive quality to that song. There's a, there's a pain in that song of the disconnect between the, the genders. and and how you really do want to understand each other. And so, because her original thing has this, that driving beat, you can kind of almost miss that quality, the plaintive mm -hmm. quality to it. And so that's what I decided to bring out in this kind of more, um, yeah, plaintive is the word, a little bit, you know, more quieter and introspective, bringing out that aspect of what the song is about. As far as uh, I believe in looking through tracks, Cloud Busting is on there as well. Is that correct? Yeah, oh, I love that song so much. Yeah, I do too. And that one, I have to say, was uh, rather easy to put together for acoustic guitar because it just has all the elements the, the way that dun, 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 mm -hmm. and then the counter string parts that we could lay over with the acoustic guitar. That one, it came together very, in my mind, as an arrangement, like, this is going to be easy. And it was. It came together really quickly. Uh, and, of course, I love the story of cloud busting. You know, how many people write songs about Wilhelm Reich's son watching him being taken away by the men in black? I mean, mm -hmm. you know. And, and it also just, but the message, too, of uh, just the positive message of love 
you know, even if you don't even know about Wilhelm Reich and all that other stuff, if you just are listening to the song casually, it has this other layer that it works on that is totally fine unto itself too, you know? I mean, that's the brilliance of her songwriting. The thing that I learned about her in this process was her incredible heart and sweetness and humor. You know, I didn't realize that, uh, and I'm as such a lover of her music and so familiar with her catalog. I didn't really realize that until I dove into it at this level. What a sweet heart and loving heart, plus this light touch of this, like a smile within that, her humor. It was a, it was such a great discovery of, of her essence, of, of her personage, as it were. And um, you spoke of the new album. Um, when can we look for that? That's an excellent question. Well, I just released an EP sampler of six songs called Curios. And there's two songs from each of my releases so far, two from Dream Dance, uh, which is Dream Dance and uh, Over the Hedge, two from Naked Kate, which is Cloud Busting and Experiment Four. By the way, these were all voted on by my fans, which ones to include on this sampler EP. And then two of them from my new album, the title track, What Have I Forgotten and Liminal. So that new music is out there right now. And I put it out now because I thought it would take so long to put albums together. Let me at least work on these mixes of these first two songs and get the sampler EP out there so we can have some new music while this new album is being developed. So right now uh, I have 10 songs fully written, fully recorded. Oh God, I'm so excited about them. I can't begin to tell you. Oh my God. Uh, three of them are fully mixed. So that means we still have seven more to mix. And there's actually, I, I, I misspoke. There's a couple things that still need to be recorded. Some bass parts and extraneous things like that. So now we're in the mixing process and that can take a long time. So I'm thinking by like a year from now. Oh, I haven't mentioned this before much, but I, I'm also working on a book that accompanies this album because each of these songs on this new album, What Have I Forgotten, are uh, a spiritual message. You know, after Keith died, I dove headlong into studying some of the ancient mysteries because I'd had some extraordinary, for lack of a better word, psychic experiences around his departure that made me feel like I had to dive more deeply into some of these unseen territories. So you can't help but have those things seep out in all that you do. And I realized that this album, each of the songs, there is some sort of metaphysical message with hidden in each of these songs. So I'm writing an accompanying book to uh, illuminate some of that more on a deeper level. And I actually brought on another person named Angus McMahon, who's an extraordinary writer. Oh, he's such a good writer uh, to work with me on that as, as either an editor or a co-writer. We're going to, you know, collate our work on that. I just started writing it this week. So uh, I'm also working on that in addition to the mixing of the album. So it's, it's quite a big, big project. When I was writing this week, I again had that same thing of, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Oh my God, why are you doing this? You know, those voices that come, stop, you're, but I was like, it's going to be okay. It's, it's going to be okay. So I'm thinking it's probably a year, I'm guessing, from now. I, I Do I give way too long? I could have said, oh, about a year from now. And that would have answered your question, right? So. No, that's. Fine. Okay. <laughs> I also want to ask you, as an independent artist, what do you feel are the given gives and takes of being an independent artist? You know, uh, I, first of all, I just want to acknowledge again how excellent your questions are, Robert. Thank you. They're so, so good, well thought out, and I just love answering them. Obviously, the number one thing that's the, the give about being an independent art, artist is doing whatever the heck you want. And you are not at the beck and call of any record label to, you know, release 
right? You, we need something that's faster, faster. Come on. We need something that's like, we want you to write something that's like Lana Del Rey or, you know, whatever. Um, uh, you can do what you are called to do. And the other give is uh, that you don't have to share the proceeds with them. I mean, you know, I've done a lot of research on what, when you have contracts with record labels, how much they actually take, which is, Oh man, <laughs> you know, it's most not like it used to be. Yeah. yeah. And so, okay. So they would, maybe they give you the funding to record and they give you funding for promotion, but honestly, they don't even really know how to promote very well because their type of promotion is throw everything, take a, like a shotgun effect. Let's throw everything against the wall and see what sticks, put things up on the side of a bus. You have no idea who's seeing it and if they care. In, in this age, as an indie artist, you know, I have learned how to target my, the people that I think are going to like my music online and, and draw them into my world like fishing, you know, and using the right bait to catch the right fish for lack of a better analogy. And you can, you can attract people that like what you're doing so that they're more likely to be into the music you're making. And so it's, much, it's a much more targeted approach and more efficient. So in some ways, as an indie artist, we also have found ways to promote ourselves that the uh, record, the big record labels haven't really quite done yet. So that's another positive. Obviously, a negative is because we have limited budgets, limited personnel. You see, in many cases, it's just the artists themselves doing everything. Uh, it takes it's much harder to be heard. It's much harder to get your stuff out there. It's It takes longer to get in front of more eyeballs and to get more ears listening to your music. So that's the big, big downside is the budget and the time and the lack of resources and human power. Uh, but another upside is I have these incredible personal relationships with my fans that I truly treasure and are deeply important to me and i get emails i got some christmas cards this year from some of them we message each other you know we ask about each other's lives that's why uh, my email list is one of my most treasured ways of connecting with my fans because i it's like one-on-one -on -one communication and i email them i've been emailing them basically weekly with writing about the process of making this new album and giving them you know little stories and insights and inspirations and tidbits and they I get written back to all the time oh my god I love your emails thank you so much I love hearing from you and it's it's a it's a much deeper connection as an indie artist that you have you know your fans are real people they're not just numbers oh yeah I sold that x amount of albums it's not that it's you're touching right. people's lives with your music and with your soul and they it matters i mean it, i get emails about how much it's helped people you know heal from trauma or sadness or depression or just get through their day or relax whatever they're doing whatever the music does for them just the the level of appreciation and to be able to receive that one-on-one -on -one and exchange that one-on-one -on -one is priceless priceless and that is because of the internet without question i also wanted to say that um almost you're fortunate that um your album is coming out next year um i've had countless artists uh tell me in the past uh months that uh vinyl is almost impossible right now because uh yeah. adele has bought uh <clears throat> 500 copies of vinyl oh interesting yeah because there are all sorts of supply chain issues right now but that is a very interesting little wrinkle i didn't think about someone like her that has such a huge fan base using up all of the resources for vinyl vinyl does take six six months to 11 months and i am planning on releasing vinyl for this album because it demands it you know the the music by the way i want to mention something about this next album that i forgot until this moment I'm working with a collaborator whose name is Francisco Vives, and he is a Chilean who now lives in the United States, and he is an extraordinarily talented and skilled musician 
who is a drummer as well as a keyboard player. And he has uh, a vast array of wonderful analog keyboards. And you know, the Prophet, which sounds phenomenal. You can't beat the sounds of these analog synths. So we've been working collaboratively on this new album, different with Dream Dance, where I did everything myself. I am now doing, he's doing it with me. So in some cases I will play, in other cases he will play, depending on, you know, the expertise. And so he, and he's a much better, much better player than I am. Because I'm a multi-instrumentalist where he is like an extraordinarily talented keyboard player and drummer. So we've been collaborating on arranging and producing this material and it's it has this whole other level of production and arrangement and range of sounds with strings and the aulos, the Greek flutes and uh, guitar, electric guitar. I also hired Winter, who's a great electric guitar player, who played this awesome guitar solo on one of my songs called Forgetting to Remember. So I have a bunch and these other guest artists I mentioned from Ireland. So I have all these guest artists on this next album which I think just makes it all the, that more rich of a stew with all of their input. So because of that, it definitely, definitely, I need to put this out on vinyl. And I already have the music. The one thing I'm starting to wonder about is, is it gonna have to be a double album? Because I, I think I already have like 50 minutes of music already. The songs are, I've noticed that this album is starting to, it's tilting into progressive art pop. It's had, you know, there's a bit of progressive quality to it. Be, a lot of it because mm -hmm. of Fran. So, you know, we have like these long, beautiful keyboard solos that kind of remind me of ELP, which by the way, I've been listening to a lot of ELP lately this year. And so that's probably seeping through in there too. So it's it's also interesting for me to just observe the my own progression as a songwriter and as a recording artist and producer you know, as you make one album to the next to the next, each one is a progression, you know? So yes, Absolutely. definitely vinyl. I need to put vinyl out for this one, which means I need to plan ahead for that, for sure. Yeah, I think Cutoff is on, on side A, on the first side on, on vinyl pressings is around 27 minutes. Oh, to give you an idea. Yeah, I thought it was 22, but is 20, you can go as long as 27. I think the longer you go, the less, the, the tighter the grooves are. So there's, it's sure. less quality, but yeah. So 27 times two is 54, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll see. We shall see. I Cause then I'm like, oh, I'd have to maybe leave a song off the vinyl, but I get attached to all of my babies. So it'd be hard for me to do that. <laughs> and also there's a flow to the album too. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's a big, it's a huge production. Let me tell you to be in charge of as an indie artist, ordering, specking out, manufacturing, doing the layout, the design uh, and getting, you know, get the test prints back and listening to them and finding the right manufacturing company to do it and timing it all with the release and getting the, then getting everything mailed out to all the fans. It's a huge huge production so that's after all the hundreds of hours of writing and producing in the studio and I mean it's it's kind of crazy when you think about it how much work goes into a recording it's massive and it doesn't you wouldn't know until you actually do it because it, it's like a meal you know when you have to go to this great gourmet meal maybe it takes days in some cases and you consume the meal in 20 minutes it's kind of like that that's ironic you mentioned that. One of my questions was, if I'm coming to dinner, what's what would be your favorite food on the menu? <laughs> oh, boy. I love Thai food. I love California cuisine that's like fusion food. So probably I would say, and I love seafood. So something that has lots of, it's funny you say that because my music kind of is the way I like food. I like uh, music that has a lot of highs and lows, like the whole sound spectrum is covered and you can hear this wonderful tapestry of all these sounds. I like my food that way too. So I don't, for instance, I'm not, I don't really care for like beef stew, you know, I mean, it's fine, 
but it's like all low end. I like food oh. that goes from the low end all the way to the high end. So you have like a dash of cilantro or lemon at the top. And then you've got this nice, rich, buttery, fat low end at the bottom and then everything in between like this big floral bouquet of flavors. That's why I like Thai food so much. And that's why I like California fusion food because they, you know, they take all this kind of like my music, you know, world music and they throw in, let's try some blue cheese with this ahi tuna and see how that goes. You know, I like a blend of flavors. I also noticed that you have ties to Ohio. I don't know if you know, but I'm from Ohio. Where from Ohio are you? I'm I'm in Maslin, Ohio. Wait a minute, where is that? I don't know where that is. Um, not far from Canton, Ohio, home of the football thing. Okay, yeah, I I was born in Dayton, Ohio, and of course, being a fan of Chrissy Hind, I sang that song many many times. I love that song. Um, and I have been back to Ohio actually, but it's been a long long time. You know the uh totality the the solar eclipse is gonna go through ohio in 2023 did you know that yes i heard that i did the first time my experience of the solar eclipse was the one in that went through oregon a couple of years ago and i wept it was so extraordinary i had no idea it was going to be such an incredible experience. It has to be the totality because I've seen partial eclipses. It's not until the moon crosses in front and, and you're completely blotted out and you can see the corona of the sun and the temperature drops like that. It's the way I, the way I explain it is you're for what you can just look at your, of course you're going through the glasses, but you can actually see the sun, it's like you can see the essence of the sun, which is the center of all our the life giving force of our planet, right? It feels like you're connecting with God, for lack of a better word, because you're, you're this in this encounter with our life force. And it just makes you start crying. And what's interesting is people around me were crying too. And they, it doesn't necessarily mean people that are even atheists or not spiritual people or whatever still found it deeply emotionally moving. And I had no idea it was gonna be like that. I just thought, oh, this is gonna be a cool astrological, astronomical event. So yeah. I have now become a little bit of an eclipse chaser and I'm definitely planning on going to the one in Ohio because why not? So you must go, you must go. Yes, and I also wanted to ask you, um, if you could give a message to your fans, what would that message be? I am so grateful for all of your love, your comments on social media, your emails, buying my music. The buying of the music is what really makes the difference versus just, you know, listening to it because that's what keeps all of us going. Taking the time to care and, um, uh, really listen to what I pour myself into that exchange is one of my greatest gifts of my whole life. And I, I literally feel gratitude every day about it every day. And it's completely changed my life because it's almost like, I feel like I'm now in service to that. And if that didn't exist, if you weren't out there, I'd still be making my music, but it's, you know, when you have a loved one and you're so excited about giving them a present and mm -hmm. the way it feels when they open the present, it, that feeling of love and exchange, that's how I feel. And it's, it, it, that's one of the most rewarding feelings in life. And so I'm so grateful that I get to feel that with you and have that exchange. Sure. Isn't it? And in essence, that's uh, basically what love is, right? Yes, um, yes. We um, will give anything for the connection. Yes, yes. I think that that's why we're here is to obviously on a biological imperative, we're supposed to you know, re re procreate, but on a deeper, more 
metaphysical and esoteric level, a spiritual level, we're here to connect and love. That's what gives our lives meaning, all of us and how we do it. We all have our own ways of doing it. And this is my way of doing it. And also to, if you can elevate someone, if you can, if you can give someone an insight about their life and touch somebody in that way, you know, that's the other thing I think that we're here to do. And we can do it going to the grocery store and just saying something to the checkout clerk that makes them go, oh, makes them feel better, makes them some, you know, have some sort of opening. That's happening day in and day out, you know, in our whole complicated web of this world that we live in. But the role of the artist, I feel, is on a, you know, that's that's what we're really here to do. Like that's our, to me, that's our manifesto as artists. We that's that's why I do what I do, you know. And that goes back yeah. to dream dance. That's the whole we dance to love, we love to dance, we move to connect in our search for a chance to be one together in this dream dance, to be whole together in this dream dance. That's, I think, what we are all seeking. Well, I wanted to thank you so much for taking time to speak with me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. I could talk to you all day. Robert, likewise, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for putting this together and reaching out and having your podcast and having this conversation. It was a pure joy. Thank you.